Hi there, I'm Abigail Penny, the Executive Director of the charity Animal Equality UK. We're the group that successfully encouraged BBC Countryfile to look into the issues within the Scottish salmon industry. Here in this interview, you can see as I speak with the world leading aquatic animal expert, Jennifer Jacquet, about what she feels was covered well during the piece, what was missing and why she feels so passionately about speaking up for our underwater friends. I hope that you find it useful and eye-opening. I certainly did. Jennifer, hi. Um, thank you so much for joining me today and especially so quickly after uh, the BBC Country File programme has just aired, I think about 30 minutes ago it finished. Um, I know I have a lot of thoughts, no doubt you do too, so I'm very keen to hear your reaction. Um, I can also see on Twitter that lots of people are getting involved in the conversation to express their disgust over the footage that they've seen. Um, but before we do get into the details of the various Scottish salmon scandals that exist, Exist. It would be great if you could just tell us a bit about yourself, your role and your expertise in the area of marine life and environments. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. I am Jennifer Jacquet. I am a professor of environmental science and policy here at the University of Miami. And I have been working in fisheries and aquaculture as global systems for about 15 years now. Uh, I am very interested in the development of offshore aquaculture and very interested in the impacts of fin fish farming on ecology, uh, food security, and of course, uh, animal welfare. It's really impressive, uh, you know, to have spent that much time dedicated to this is uh, really quite incredible. Uh, I'm really grateful for you to give up your time to talk to us. Um, so I know that I was furiously scribbling away uh, during the 10 minute program um, and I've been collecting my thoughts ever since. Um, so for those viewers who haven't seen the full piece yet, for me, one of the key takeaways seemed to be informing consumers about the rising rate of on-farm deaths. Um, we saw in the programme that Matt Palmer from the group Wildfish said on Country File that one in four salmon die before even reaching the abattoir. So we know that something like 16.7 million Scottish salmon died before reaching the slaughterhouse last year. And if action isn't taken quickly, 2023 is looking like it's going to be the deadliest year on record. Um, when I pitched the programme to Country File, I emphasised this point because to me, these mortalities are emblematic of the many devastating impacts of this industry. We know, for example, that salmon face so many problems during their short lives. Um, and I was pleased to see that the BBC did include a lot of the undercover footage that was provided by animal quality, um, showing a lot of fish suffering in underwater cages. And many people aren't aware of that. So what do you think causes these mortalities and what can be done to curb the problem? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I have to trust the, the program to some extent or, or even the farms to some extent when they are attributing deaths to jellyfish and water temperatures. I don't have access to that data. Nobody really does right now, except for, you know, the, the broader situation. But that kind of localized event, we largely trust the industry for, for those sources of mortality across industries. Um, and I don't think that those sources of mortality are going to be easing up, unfortunately, in the Anthropocene. We do know it's a particularly bad year due to El Nino and re world record hot temperatures. But as you're pointing out, the one in four is actually from last year. And this year, we may actually be seeing higher mortality rates. The thing for me about the program was that the emphasis on fish welfare was really revolutionary, really wonderful to see the BBC involved seriously in the conversation, incorporating the voices of veterinarians, of course, industry, um, also organizations like yours. But from my perspective, you know, welfare is only the tip of the iceberg. We have this huge mortality, of course, that goes into the fish meal industry to feed these fish. And then all of these other issues like pollution as a result of the feed, uh, antibiotic overuse and sea lice transmission. And those weren't really covered to the extent that at least I, I work on them. And so the welfare angle was new, it was fresh, it was great, but I felt like it didn't get into a lot of the broader issues. 
I absolutely agree. I was actually really surprised to see that there was not really anything mentioned about the scale of the environmental impact that the industry has. You know, we know, as you mentioned, that salmon are carnivorous animals. Um, One salmon is responsible for consuming around 150 other smaller fish during their lifetime. And this is absolutely wiping out our wild fish stocks and causing havoc in the oceans. But also on top of that, we know that farmed fish often escape and then will mate with wild salmon um, and that there's a high use of chemicals to get rid of the lice that are so prolific in these fish farms. So given all of these facts and your expertise over the past decade and a half, um, do you think that Scottish salmon farming can ever be sustainable? I don't think that fin fish farming can be sustainable, frankly, under these conditions. I mean, you're talking about farming carnivores, which is something we don't do on land. So you see a lot of false equivalencies drawn across these industries. You heard it in the program at several points like, oh, this is like chicken or or like taking care of pigs. And then uh, one of the industry representatives mentioned that whenever you have uh, you're producing protein, you have input inputs and impacts. But this is a false equivalency, because if you're using plant based proteins, the impacts are much lower, even on terrestrial protein. If you want to talk about animals in that term under those terms, this is a really different system. You they're still still herbivores. You are feeding them enormous amounts of grain that impact the Amazon and other places. And it's still inefficient from almost any point of view, but it's very different than farming carnivores. So that was another kind of slip in the program where you see these false equivalencies drawn across when you flatten something to protein, um, you can make those kind of arguments. But really, we're talking about carnivores versus herbivores versus eating plant based proteins. And if we looked at that whole picture, as scientists have done many times, the benefits of, of focusing on the plant based proteins for human nutrition is just is just obvious. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, animal equality, of course, we're here in defense of of animals and their sentience. We know in the UK, they recently introduced the sentience bill, recognizing animals as capable of feeling pain. And that included farmed fish, too. And as you say, not only is there scientific consensus that salmon feel pain, but also that Atlantic salmon are migratory animals who in the wild would travel many, many miles upstream. So it seems to me especially cruel that they would be confining them in crowded cages for their entire lives when they're not able to carry out most of their most basic natural behaviors. Uh, You know, what do you think life is like for for farmed salmon? Yeah, again, I I had a I have a real issue when you just reduce kind of farmed animals into that one category because the animals themselves are so different. And I think we know so much less about farmed salmon. Um, They're relatively recently domesticated, per your point, compared to wild salmon. Um, They I mean, and uh, certainly compared to wild salmon, they're still, you know, very closely related to them, but also compared to farm chicken and farmed pigs and, and farm cows. And we're not talking about thousands of years of domestication the way we are in those systems. They certainly still have the desire to migrate, as you point out, which is why they're circling in the net pens. And that's also, um, you know, some people have speculated a source of aggression. You see uh, a lot of cases in that undercover footage of of what looks to be like victims of aggression potentially or of of or of jellyfish it's sort of hard to attribute why they're in such bad shape um in one case i saw one of the fish had you know was looked maybe like it had a fungal infection or it was not it was in really rough shape so um so again, it's a little hard to say, and and the system is pretty new. You know, they talked about this woman ha- having worked on the farms for 27 years. That's still nothing like, you know, farming sheep in Mesopotamia. These are really new systems. We are still at a point where we can decide whether or not we want to c- take this path forward. And it was really heartening to me to hear that um, the Scottish government had already decided that we they didn't want to move the pens further offshore. There's sort of a stay on that at the moment. And it was framed as a missed opportunity by industry, but I would call it more like preventative medicine. I mean, this is really uh, a good decision in the face of so much uncertainty and so many obvious risks. Yeah, I agree. That was it's a good segue actually into my next question for you, which is, 
you know, it was pretty clear industry representatives, for example, from Lock Long Salmon in the BBC programme, they implied that certain technologies might be the answer, like semi-closed containers, which, as I understand it, are essentially the same as sea pens, really, but have a sort of balloon underneath that captures the faeces and prevents the lice from getting through. Um, or, as you mentioned, on land factory farms for fish as well. And both of these technologies are particularly worrying to me because they're heralded as if they're a fix-all solution. Uh, but we know that, OK, they may fix one problem, but then they'll cause a whole heap of their own. Um, and as you say, Scotland has rejected them already, but there's still a bit of an appeal process going on. But also similarly in Canada and British Columbia, they were very quickly closed down with these semi uh, closed containers because of technical failures and mass mortality. So what do you think of this sort of trial and error approach and these supposed innovations? Yeah, I mean, I think you you said it well. The truth is that it only addresses one of the many issues that we talked about, right? It doesn't address the welfare concerns, it doesn't address the fish meal issue, which again has knock on welfare concerns because you're having to kill wild fish to feed to these farmed fish. And it doesn't um, deal with also the question that we haven't talked much about, which is, what is this all for? I mean, they introduced the program as this is our large export industry. It's not about feeding the Scottish people. And they also said, you know, it's really about uh, the, the economy and about the jobs. Um, we can have an economy and jobs built around anything. You know, we had there was a segment right before that one about sort of um, maintaining um, nature preserves for birds. You know, you could easily employ people to restore uh, aquatic systems for wild salmon that may ultimately draw wild salmon watchers the way that we have bird watchers. We have to sort of rethink our relationships entirely in the 21st century under all of these pressures. And so if we, it's just about jobs and the economy, we can be much more imaginative we're, it's not about feeding people. That's the fortunate thing, because farm salmon is really a luxury product. It is just there to create money and we can create money in all sorts of other ways. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better myself. And I actually think it's it's a shame when I hear that argument come up because they're actually failing to future proof people's jobs. Um, and that's the part of the puzzle that never never really gets attention is that, you know, if they carry on in this unsustainable way, there will be no way for these jobs to still exist in a decade's time or a few decades time. So really, they are putting people out of jobs long term if they don't start to change with the times and, and acknowledge that this is a an inherently cruel and unsustainable industry. Um, to me, it is particularly apparent that uh, the Scottish salmon industry is not being properly regulated, more must be done by the government. So if you had the opportunity to speak to a Scottish politician today, what would you say to them? What would be your call to action? I mean, my call to action would be to listen to the scientific advice. The science is very clear. Uh, fin fish farming was recommended against since the 1970s. Scientists have been urging the system to move away from carnivorous species, to move more toward bivalves, which for which there are fewer sentience concerns as well and towards seaweeds, that uh, we could do aquaculture or mariculture in ways that met these criteria, that fed people, that didn't uh, destroy the, the wild fish, that restored ecosystems. And we have opportunities to do, to, to do so. Unfortunately, there are massive amounts of subsidies behind salmon farms, and that's part of the reason why they persist. It isn't about a kind of clarity or vision for the future so much as a kind of existing power structure that we have to dismantle in the same way that we have to think about um, ending fossil fuel use. I mean, these are this really is, as you point out, fundamentally unsustainable. It doesn't have a, a future. And in the meantime, it's causing um, a lot of short term problems as well for the animals, but even for the, the local environments. And one thing the program didn't mention and you often don't see mentioned is how many places have actually put in uh, bans in place on on fin fish farming. So the state of Alaska has has banned fin fish farming from the start because, of course, they have wild salmon. Um, parts of British Columbia are phasing out uh, farm salmon, one of the biggest mistakes that province ever made. Uh, we have, I think, the state of Washington now banning 
non-native um, fish farms. And um, did you see in Tierra del Fuego, Argentina, they put in a preemptive ban on offshore farming uh, or net pen farming. And given, I, I think De Denmark too froze the, the, the footprint. Um, and so when you see other countries around the world are making these decisions, there is obvious a clear scientific basis for doing so. Um, and a, a clear democratic push for that. So I hope that the, the Scottish government and parliament will turn to the science and look for um, and look for the evidence. Absolutely, me too. It, it actually fills me with a lot of optimism uh, to talk to, to people like you and to see some of the, the changes that are happening all around us, all around the globe. So um, thank you so much for your time, for sharing your thoughts and your insights so eloquently. Um, I'm really very grateful for everything that you do. And I have a great deal of respect um, that you are dedicating your, your time and your profession to speaking up for these often neglected animals. You as well, of course. Thanks for having me on and sharing the program. Thanks, Jennifer. As the Scottish salmon industry grows, so does the risk that these associated issues will grow too. The best thing that you can do as a consumer is to ditch salmon and swap for plant-based alternatives instead. It's never been easier. But also we're calling on the Scottish government to use its power and stop this industry in its tracks. So please have your voice heard too, sign our petition and speak up for farmed fish today. Thank you.